Thanks everybody for, uh, for joining me this morning. Um, we're gonna cover a lot of the changes uh, that have happened over, over the course of this year and what businesses can do to both adapt and make the most of those changes. Um, it's been a crazy year and social media channels have not spared us from their share of turbulence either. Uh, I'm Patrick King. Um, I have a longer beard now, uh, and I'm founder and CEO of Imagine. We're a multidisciplinary uh, marketing agency headquartered in Manassas. We also have offices in Richmond and Norfolk. Uh, multidisciplinary, it really just means that we cover research, strategy, digital branding, web development, campaigns, just in fewer syllables. Um, the itinerary for today. So we're gonna start with the algorithm shifts. Uh, we're going to cover Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Yelp, uh, and then some bright best practices for each. Uh, next, we're going to go to some strategies based on those changes. Uh, we'll go over to strategy development, where we go pretty in-depth on how to develop your own long-term uh, marketing approach step-by-step. -step. Then we'll do a quick case study where we put this strategy in action and then we'll end with some, uh, some Q and A. Um, all of the complexity of social media's willingness to block or improve our visibility comes from, yes, algorithms. Simply algorithms are calculations that provide a predetermined action to data that we put in, right? It, the algorithms are all around us. It's not just social media. Search engines use them, and you mentioned uh, smart home devices, Kyle. That they use they use algorithms uh, in, the, in the exact same way. There is a train coming. If it gets louder, we'll just pause, and I'll pick up when it when it passes. Oh, there it is. Just a minute. Yeah, we're in Manassas, right next to the train station. All right, I think we're good. Okay, understanding every nuance of each platform's algorithm can be exhausting. They can be triggered by how frequently you post, how active your audience is, even what you do in other places online. Uh, but fortunately, we can impact all those things and we can guide the algorithms to work for us. Let's start with the big mama, uh, Facebook. The algorithm changes that Facebook throws out uh, probably draw the ire of more marketers than any other platform. Anyone with a company page on Facebook knows how frustrating it can be to publish a post and then only have maybe three or 4% of your audience actually see it. Um, there are some techniques we can use to combat this and I'll share them in a moment. But first, let's talk about what the, what the algorithm first. Facebook has expanded the areas of content, the, type, the, the uh, topics that it frowns upon to now include like regulated products. Uh, while a lot of things won't apply when you're when under a business context, actually the, the mention of alcoholic beverages is now frowned upon. That can be trouble, troubling for the brewers and distilleries and people that we work with. So they would need to be careful about how to talk on their page promoting an experience instead of a product. But for today's audience, uh, let's talk about uh, something that's been a long time coming, I think, contests and giveaways. Over time, I've seen the popularity of these die off, uh, but for those that are still looking to follow this route to get some quick followers, know that it's time has come. Uh, there is a, there's a list of, um, trigger words that, uh, that Facebook has tied into their al algorithm. And there are words that it won't, uh, that will actually diminish your visibility for using over, over a repeated period of time. Um, and if you, know, if you wanna get that, that list, shoot me an email. I'll have my email at the end of the presentation and I'll send you over that list and make sure that you're just aware that these lists, these words, while they might seem innocuous, may actually hurt your visibility. Uh, 
Next, uh, last year, uh, Mark Zuckerberg announced that the future is private, predicting that people would look for more private social experiences instead of scrolling social feeds. And if you're on Facebook and Instagram, you may have noticed that they now share the same messenger app. Uh, th this move, it's an effort to amplify those types of private experiences and make sure that um, make sure that, that brands are ready to have those types of conversations. And a little further in the presentation, I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. Next is unoriginal content. And by this, they're typically talking about a pattern of third party links. It's okay to share websites on, on social media, but Facebook frowns upon doing it too much. Uh, Facebook doesn't want its users to leave so links to other sites have become increasingly frowned upon. As I said, one or two every long while is fine, but if you make a habit of it, then you're going to see your visibility diminish. Finally, and this is a very important one, um, a disproportionate amount of traffic from Facebook. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what happens with your brand on other parts of the internet can actually impact what happens within one social channel. Um, if Facebook is where you do a bulk of your marketing, the algorithm is now going to devalue your posts, uh, which means it's a good idea to spread out your social visibility, publish articles somewhere online, maybe run some PR or paid ads on Google. We've all seen the overwhelming amount of clickbait posts on Facebook, you know, like 10 celebrities that shouldn't have worn this or, you know, uh, 20 photos that you won't believe were taken, that kind of stuff, that type of clickbait, Facebook's trying to clamp down on that. And this is their way of being able to show them less. So if you're predominantly getting business from Facebook, you're going to see a drop in your visibility because put simply, your stuff is considered clickbait. I mentioned earlier that there are some ways to improve your visibility when you only get a handful of eyeballs on each post. I just said a handful of eyeballs. That's gross. Um, a few techniques to use uh, are first, tagging people and other companies in your posts whenever relevant. Um, doing this notifies those people and those companies, which encourages them to engage with your posts. Engagement meaning sharing, commenting, maybe even following the page and so on. If you make a habit of this, whenever you're gonna put, if there's a person that you're mentioning, uh, could be an employee, could be a vendor, could be a team member, could be a customer um, or, or a company, same thing. Try to make a habit of tagging them wherever possible. Um, you can also tag people in photos, tag companies in photos because it'll work in two different ways, right? Um, another approach, is to stick to a schedule of conversational posts. Um, conversational, I'll talk about that in a minute, but more or less, it's you want to drive conversation. Uh, you want people to comment, you want people to engage. The frequency in, uh, in the schedule doesn't matter as much as the consistency. Uh, I'll talk about that too a little later. And so conversational, you don't want them to be one-sided announcements. You don't want to just blurt out a, uh, um, a promotion because it's going to fall on deaf ears. People aren't going to be that excited about it. People are tired of promotions and promotions are ordinary. And a phrase that I just learned this week or last week, last week, that is stuck in my head is people don't share ordinary. They don't share promotions. They don't share stuff that, that they expect. You have to show people some the things that they don't expect. That's where you, that's where you get shares. Um, likes aren't gonna help much if your visibility has been punished. Uh, you need heavier engagement. And one more thing regarding Facebook. You may have noticed over the past few months that posts in public groups are now more visible. Uh, this can be used to great effect if your page is involved in local groups. Uh, just make sure that your posts aren't spammy and that you're also engaging with other members' posts as your page as well. 
Uh, this helps visibility, but more importantly, it also helps build trust with other group members. If you're gonna engage with a group, make sure you actually engage with a group. Don't just pop in, try to sell something. Become part of the community. Moving on. Let's talk about Instagram, which is my personal favorite for a bunch of reasons, but most importantly, it's because of the lack of bickering that you normally see on Facebook and the lack of spammy salesy posts that you see on other channels. They've made a lot of recent, a lot of changes recently to the overall experience. Maybe the most dramatic of any of the platforms I've seen recently. Uh, first, they're expanding options for online sellers with product feeds that flow right into the profile. And they're adding new shop buttons to profiles and, and even some posts without, uh, without brands having to pay for them. It all comes down to reputation. Um, with being able, with social commerce, being able to sell, that sort of stuff. The catch is that the functionality isn't available to everyone. You have to be an established account meaning that you've been on Instagram for some time uh, and that you have a sizable following. Next, uh, your products have to be reviewed and approved before the feed can go live. Next is their increased preference to accounts that post stories that are playing on their new feature, Instagram Reels. If anybody's familiar with TikTok, Instagram Reels is really just Instagram trying to be like TikTok. Um, you get, it gives you a bunch of video effects that you can use to get kind of the same experience just with fewer of your kids' friends watching it. They also give added eyeballs to brands that qualify for and use the e-commerce functionality that I just mentioned. They're increasing their preference for accounts that engage with other accounts, that whole social part of social media. Um, a good rule of thumb is to try to comment as much as you post if not more, um, that's one of the, once again, it's one of the things that, that builds engagement. They're also working on a feature in the app that lets you see more than like a handful of stories that are currently at the top of your feed. This is to encourage brands and users to post more stories. And stories can be photos, they can be videos. Um, so if you know it's important to them, then it's something that your account should probably do as well. Finally, if you're active on Instagram, you may have noticed that the power of hashtags has dropped recently. Um, this is in response to a lot of the stuff that's going on around, uh, around the election. They're just trying to, just trying to dial back. Um, and I expect that it's going to recover to where it was recently within a few weeks. Next, Twitter. Ah, Twitter. Not much happens with Twitter's algorithm, honestly. It's pretty simple and consistent, which in a way is the beauty of it. Uh, there are some things that you should know about it though, if it's part of your, your tool set. First, engagement rules. The more engagement, the longer your tweet will be shown. Um, by engagement, I'm not talking about likes, in order to get the most miles out of your tweets, they need shares and discussion. Your tweets will remain in your followers' feeds longer if there's conversation, if there are retweets, then it's showing Twitter, hey, this is important, more people need to see it. And that's how you keep your tweets alive, basically. Um, the only real big change to the platform happened last year when they gave users the option to load the most popular tweets instead of just the recent ones, just a way of reorganizing your content. It's not really a novel feature. Other platforms have had it for years. So really, the key thing here is just driving engagement. That's all they care about. The same cannot be said for YouTube though. Their algorithm changes so much that one day I think content creators are gonna riot. Um, one recent change is more attention being given to the viewer, to the user. Uh, traditionally, the success of a video was totally up to the content creator. Um, the content of the video, the reputation of the publisher, but now YouTube is factoring in the viewer's history more and more. For example, if, if a, a viewer normally only watches three to four minute videos, 
Um, if they want to look up a recipe for, say, smoked brisket, they're probably not going to be served a 30 minute version. They're probably going to be served a version that fits more in the amount in that matches their behavior more closely. Um, another big change, and frankly, a welcome one, relates to what they call borderline content. This is content that doesn't quite violate YouTube's policies, but just skirts around them. And this includes inaccurate information that could be taken as fact. Uh, finally, more attention and more scrutiny is paid to content that the publisher confirms is okay to show kids. The goal is to make YouTube a more family-friendly platform. And I kind of sped through those last two points with borderline content and, and uh, stuff being okay for kids, because while it's important for you to know them, hopefully it doesn't influence your content choices that much. All right, finally, Yelp, the channel we love to hate. While a lot of what they program into the site is an obvious cash grab, there are some features that make sense when you think about it. First, like YouTube, is the consideration that they give to the, to the viewer or the, the user when showing results. The, the types of activity that a user takes, the number of solid reviews they've given, and so on, can impact what they're shown since the platform knows the user better. Basically, the more you use it, the better content you're gonna be given. Uh, some of you may notice this, but when you get a review, uh, it doesn't factor into your overall star rating. If you get a bunch of reviews all at once, Yelp has a way of saying that some of these reviews uh, may not be authentic or suggested. The rule of thumb here is to get good reviews consistently over time. Uh, you can't control when someone posts a review, of course, uh, so you have to play the long game with this one uh, and build your reputation with Yelp over time. Uh, I've had a number of clients that will get five or six reviews in all at once and they haven't had any for a few weeks, and half of them will be not suggested. And I can't tell you how, how, how many times I've been on the phone with Yelp going, hey, you think you could fix this? This is a stupid idea. And they're like, no, there's no, nothing, really nothing we can do. So that's great. So an idea that uh, we've started using for our clients is creating review cards. They're the size of a business card and they have two QR codes on them. One is for Google, one's for Yelp. Um, if you pass these out to clients, customers that you're sure want to say something positive, um, if you know they've had a great experience, then hand them, hand them one of these cards. They may not have the time to do the review right then, but later on at the end of the day, they'll have that opportunity still. Uh, for the next feature, this also takes the user into account. The listings they're shown have more to do with the user's history and geography than your star rating. Having 100% five-star ratings doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna to have top visibility. Uh, so increasing the number of business categories can. So make sure that you're showing under as many categories as possible. Um, okay, I think that may be, that's a lot of algorithm talk there. Um, I could go on for longer, but I'm sure we all have things we want to get done this weekend. So let's move on to what you can put into place right now to make the most of these channels. There are five, six, I think I have six, six main strategies to follow. And while many of you are doing these to some degree, it's important to stress consistency. Your channels will be rewarded over time, but you have to know what needs to be consistent and where to put your attention. For each strategy, um, I chose to show travel photos in this section. Uh, they don't pertain to the strategies themselves, but I'm travel deprived and this is a way of just scratching that itch. So if you will humor me, um, I just like to look at these photos. Thank you. All right, time. Time is almost as important as the content you post or the platform you use. Timing, recency, and frequency will be your friends in the long term. Um, I can't reliably give everyone a universal time 
that you should post when all your posts are going to work. It simply doesn't work that way, regardless of what you've read online. You have to find the right time for your accounts. You can find those times in either Hootsuite if you use it, Google Analytics if you use it, or the insights section of each platform. Uh, only those times can be accurate for you. Uh, frequency and consistency will take care of the recency issue. In terms of frequency, it's a tortoise and the hare situation. Don't commit to four or five posts per week if you can't maintain it. You're better off in the eyes of the platforms if you post twice a week, but do it consistently over a period of time. Make sure that when you start, that the schedule you commit to is sustainable for the long term. All right. Uh, this one can be strangely difficult, uh, but it's vital to your social media plan. Use it as it's intended. By that, I mean, use it for conversations and engagement. Comment on other accounts, aim to have responses in your own posts. Use it as a communication tool, just like you would use it personally. That activity plays into the reputation of your account and will have a tremendous impact on your visibility. So many accounts we see have one-way information, promotions, announcements, so on, just blasting, just, just vomiting stuff out and not having any, any following, following conversation. Those don't get engagement, and which hurts their visibility over time. Um, as I mentioned, we have that list of trigger words that if you, if you want to copy, send me an email and I'll, I'll, send, I'll shoot the list over to you. When it comes to driving conversations, you don't always have to ask questions either. You can share stories of your team or, or partners or customers. Um, find ways to tell stories of your organization's history, maybe those customer experiences, things that bring a human factor to your content. Uh, people engage more with people than they do promotions. They always have, always will. So telling stories about people um, and making, making sure that you tag those people so they know you're saying good things about them will, will prompt them to, uh, to comment, uh, whether it's a thank you, whether they want to embellish, whatever it is, that kind of stuff drives conversation. Now, I alluded to this earlier when I was talking about Instagram. When a platform rolls out a new feature, they will always give preference to those accounts that adopt it. The reason is simple. Uh, they want their new features to be successful as well. So they'll be making them as visible as possible. So ride that wave. You know, take a look at uh, Instagram Reels. See if there's a way to use it in your marketing mix. Uh, Facebook and Instagram Stories are, may, may be more relevant options. So find ways to use them at least. And whenever you hear that, Whenever you see a new feature that's being rolled out, see what, see how you can make that work. If you can't, you can't, but see if it makes sense. I mentioned earlier how the future is private. Messenger and messaging apps are being used more and more by brands to connect one-on-one -on -one with potential and current customers, which makes sense because People more and more don't want to talk on the phone anymore, but they do want quicker answers than they may get by filling out a contact form or sending an email. So this kind of fits perfectly right in the middle. Um, the Messenger platform uh, allows you to provide predetermined questions and answers to a degree for people that are just shopping around. So you're not bombarded with a bunch of the same questions over and over again. At a point when the questions become specific, the chat can be moved over to a real person, person on your, on your team that can continue the conversation. Um, I mentioned SMS here, and I know it's technically not social media, but it's worth talking about. Uh, text message marketing is becoming simpler to use, more affordable, and remains a high touch, low cost way to drive private conversations. Um, there's a platform that, that we use, and the name sounds kind of dumb, but it's easy texting, letter E, letter Z, texting.com. Um, they make SMS really as simple as sending out a text only email. They have a pay as you go plan, so you're not spending more than you use. Um, and 
there's there's no like term length for your contract. So that's something worth checking out. Next, over the course of this year, your audience has undoubtedly changed. Uh, I know I'm speaking to a bunch of different industries right now, but I can say without a doubt that if you haven't done your persona research uh, over the past six months, you are long overdue. If you're not sure how or even what persona development is, don't worry, I'm gonna give you a run through shortly. Finally, once your personas are current, build what they call an omni-channel strategy to capture them on every channel and lead them to the desired action. You know, I mentioned before that uh, um, uh, Facebook frowns upon clickbait or if they see a disproportionate amount of traffic coming from just them to the website, then that can hurt you. Um, creating an omni-channel strategy means finding the channels that work, using them as part of an overall mix, uh, and then in unison, you build a more impactful, longer-term marketing program. I'm gonna show you how to do that as well. Everybody with me so far? Cool, all right, good. The first step to effective strategy is knowing your customer. Uh, this is a persona builder that we use at Imagine in the early stages of campaigns, and it helps us determine the needs, values, desires, and ultimately what fulfillment means to each type of customer for an organization. It also helps to us determine where, when, and with what type of messaging can best communicate with them. You'll see in this case, I'm not going with a specific business. Uh, we work with uh, a lot of localities on tourism and economic development and stuff, and doing, doing so can be a bit bigger challenge than just one single business. So I'm just going to use a visitor to a new town just as an example. Um, it'll be a visitor to a new town during a pandemic. So this really tests our approach. Uh, we're gonna come back to the persona, but when I say each type of customer, let me illustrate. Uh, for the purposes of our previous persona, uh, for, uh, for this persona, we're gonna take a look at, at the challenges of a town and there are a lot of variables to consider when you're talking, when you're looking at your customers. Each group profile has different motivations, has different levels of involvement, desired outcomes. So it's important from the jump to create separate personas within your audience. You take all the data at your disposal and start to formulate your perfect customer by the behaviors that they've demonstrated. Now, where you get this data, it really, or where they're active or what type of con content they care about depends on what platforms you use to market, they're mainly online, but Speaking with people on your front line can also give you some insights to round these out. These are some common platforms where you can get a lot of the information to build out your personas. For financial history, of course, there's QuickBooks or a conversation with your finance department. Um, but if, you, if, you, if you're not using Google Analytics or something comparable, let me know. We set that up for free for people here because it's just that important. If you're using Facebook, you have access to Facebook Insights. Um, if you've done surveys in the past, that's wonderful because that gives you your answers right there. If you're using uh, an email marketing platform, doesn't have to be MailChimp, although it should. Uh, Constant Contact works just as well. If you use a POS system, all of these, all all these are just platforms, um, and they all and they give you the data you need to build out your personas. Um, <clears throat> Also, I'm sure everybody on the call has industry publications that your target audience is, for target audience information that can help as well. So with that data, you build a clear vision of your customers. So their preferred method of communication, so you can see top center, we know what they use the most, we know what they, what they, what they don't use, right? <clears throat> um, we know what type of content resonates with them even if we're just getting likes at the moment. So we have an idea of the type of content and the voice that works. Um, we can tell from Google Analytics where they get their information because we can tell where our traffic sources come from. Maybe they come from Yelp. Maybe they come from just Google. Maybe they come from social. Maybe they're direct because you have a direct mail campaign. If you have a direct mail campaign, you wanna make sure that it works. Make sure you're using custom URLs and that sort of stuff so they're easy to track. But 
we can figure out how they get their information. Uh, we can figure out their goals or objectives really by just asking them. Um, surveys are great for that. Uh, engagement and email marketing is great for that. Um, figure out uh, getting some blog posts that tackle, you know, what some what we consider to be uh, barriers barriers to entry. And then uh, personal interest. You can find those interests in, in uh, Google Analytics, and that can help you match your content up with stuff that they're already interested in. Yeah. So how do we get this person to do what we'd like for them to do? Where's the black magic here? And it happens here. This is the trusty marketing funnel or sales funnel, customer journey, workflow. The process has a ton of different names. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this. The purpose of this diagram is to craft and track each step of a person's experience with your brand so that the entire experience is designed for their enjoyment with their needs at the center of your marketing activity. This, this changes your, your marketing mindset from being sales centric to customer centric. And customer centric is far more powerful. Um, You'll see we've populated the journey with the, the tools and tactics that we know will reach that previous persona. For example, um, we know that they're, that, that they're active on, on Facebook. We know that we get traffic from TripAdvisor and Google and so on. So this is populated with the, with the tools that we're gonna use. Next, we place our key performance indicators, our KPIs for each step. So, and these are the things that we're gonna measure the success of each phase of the funnel by. Um, so that we can quickly know if we're doing well at one step, but then they're dropping off at another. For instance, if they're not converting and we're getting a lot of web traffic, then we need to take a look at, the, at, the, at what's happening during the research phase. And that's list and follower growth. If we're not seeing list and follower growth, then we need to go, oh, wait a minute, maybe our content's not quite good enough. Maybe we need to figure out how to beef that up. Um, and then for, for a conversion to referral, same thing. If we're getting a lot of sales, but nobody's talking us up, what can we do? And this funnel helps, helps you figure that out. Finally, we're gonna go a step further and we're gonna design that customer experience. How can we use each stage as an opportunity to do something that our audience thinks is remarkable. How can we take each of these as an opportunity to create something that's not ordinary? Uh, we're going, we go beyond what others are doing in these channels to something that's both unique and tailored to the interests of that particular audience. For instance, um, we, know that, we know that this persona is a mother of young kids. So, Maybe, maybe special parking is a consideration. Definitely activities for children is a consideration. Um, merchant promos, if we know that, our, that they're cost conscious, we can find out they're cost conscious by their activity on Google Analytics. Um, things like scavenger hunts or games that people can easily and comfortably engage in could be a help for first time visitors to a new town. Depending on the complexity of your organization or simply the personality of your personas, this can be more complex or it can be simpler. Increased complexity is fine since a lot of the work you do at each stage of the journey can either be automated or used over and over without developing new pieces for each opportunity. It's, it's kind of one thing one things you set, you can walk away from it and that can handle a lot of the needs of multiple pers uh, personas. So this is a customer centric experience. It takes into account what we know has changed about our customers, puts their desire for trust, as well as any nuances that we need to consider at the center of our marketing. Uh, we've used this methodology for almost every client that we work with right now. And uh, I'll, I'll show a case study. Um, we did a series of campaigns for Massanut and Water Park. Uh, they gave us two months, two, maybe three months, to turn around two campaigns to boost visits to their park with the reach goal 
of making the park enough revenue to afford a massive expansion. Um, the two campaigns, they're, they're on our website, um, but they, they're used to position Massanutten as a favorable alternative to going to the beach, which is a tall order, um, or just a break from the everyday, right? Uh, this, this is one of them. Looking for a summer vacation without all the hassle? Beat the beach at the national award-winning Massanutten Water Park. Enjoy indoor and outdoor family fun, like our tube slides. Giant tipping bucket. And the largest flow rider in Virginia. Forget about beach traffic, sandy towels, and unpredictable weather. Instead, enjoy dining, arcade games, and endless water-filled fun. Massanutten Water Park has everything your family wants, and nothing they don't. To make your summer vacation fun to remember. All right, so <clears throat> um, quick story about this. You know how difficult it is to find a beach to film a video and get approval to film that video when the locality knows that you're trying to make beaches look bad? It's, it's, it's practically impossible. We did find a beach. Actually, it was more like somebody's, more like somebody's backyard. It was like maybe a 50 foot stretch of beach. The, the beach, the amount of beach that you saw in the video was the entire beach. It was someplace out in the northern neck. They're like, well, I don't care if you make it look bad. It already does. But anyway, um, uh, so the results of the campaign are on this slide. Well, most of them, most of them. Uh, they did get enough to do their expansion, uh, and we picked up a few awards along the way for the campaigns. All that is to say that the methodology that we use, when it's executed right, it works. Um, now, with that... Um, I'll, I'll take some questions, but there are, there were some questions from the beginning. Um, Kyle mentioned a voice search, and let me, let me go ahead and unmute everyone. I think that's everyone. Oh. Okay. Uh, Kyle mentioned voice search, um, making sure that you're the, the preferred choice when it comes to smart devices. And this is something that we in the marketing community have been talking about for a few years. Um, it's, there are a couple of things that, that, that come into play here. One is your consistent social activity. It builds your reputation everywhere online. But second is making sure that you, you adjust your, your social, your search engine optimization strategy to include more natural keywords, um, more natural phrases more of the things that people are actually going to ask their smart device. You need to make sure that you make that shift over to something more natural. Because that in combination with your online reputation, that's one of the, that's what puts you over the edge there. Yeah. Um, and then Jeff, you mentioned, mentioned Google. There, it seems like the, the questions that we got, they're all SEO related. Which is fine because um, I'm overdue for doing our next uh, our next SEO uh, webinar, which I'll probably squeeze in next month. Um, how to how to make how to make yourself more more visible on Google? Um, Jeff, could you remind me exactly how how that was phrased? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I'm. I'm just not sure. I'm I, I'm not uh, Google savvy, okay. and so I've run various Google ads. I've played. I use Google Analytics, um, and I guess uh, I'm just not sure what content 
to use or how to present it in a way that I'm really engaging people. But you gave me some ideas as we were going through this, and I really appreciate that, Patrick. Uh, so that's gonna, well, I think that's gonna be helpful to make some changes to the way I run ads and posts and, and, and so forth. Okay, good. Yeah, starting, starting out with the framework and figuring out exactly what you're gonna post, mm -hmm. you know, what you're gonna use for ad copy, making sure that the that the, the copy in the ads is also reflected on the landing page, builds the, the ad rank for the ad itself. Okay. Make sure that, 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 that it's reflected on the actual landing page. Because landing page experience is one of the major factors in, to, in the, the success of Google Ads. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and then Kate, you mentioned uh, um, what to title images. Um, that's that really it really comes down to doing keyword research. Uh, there's a there's a tool we use called SEM Rush that allows us to see what what the competition uses for their keywords and basically scrubs their websites and goes, okay, well this is what it looks like they're trying to dominate on. Gives you an idea of what the search traffic is, the popularity, all that sort of stuff. And from there, you can kind of weave in. You, you find the best opportunity. The best opportunity comes from a high amount of um, a high amount of traffic, not a high amount of competition. So it's you have to find the balance there. But once you do, you find five to seven of those to start, and then those become the keywords that you want to rank for. And then you try to use those phrases in either images or, more importantly, the alt tags of your web of, of your images because alt tags are what show up if the picture doesn't load or, um, or if somebody has like, a, um, like a accessibility issues. That's what shows up in place of the image. It also helps tell the search engine this is what the picture is because search engines don't have eyeballs. And so alt tags are more important than the name of the image, but it's a pretty good practice to, to do, do it with both. So for for naming, essentially, I could essentially name a photo with words that has nothing to do with the photo, just to add that keyword. Or you could, you could, but ideally, everything will be aligned so that image will be will be relevant. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you 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 could name it every anything you want, but it's usually best practice to just make sure everything is aligned. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? I do have a question for you. So I know you don't sleep because you work nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> so your coffee is actually rocket fuel. So I understand that. But for the average person who now is going to take on this task of doing social media, at what point do you recommend they need to bring in someone else? Like they've gotten the extent of what they can do while running a business is here. And now they need to start looking and not necessarily a long-term plan, but a short-term, is that a thing where they can hire someone as a short-term marketing push or do they really need to find the financing and commit to a long-term engagement specialist? Well, here's what I've seen works, both with our clients and with, uh, um, with other companies and other agencies. Um, usually when they, when a company needs marketing help, um, they'll typically turn to an agency first. Uh, the reason why is because the, the type of commitment is typically easier because nobody likes firing people. Although there've been a couple people that I didn't mind. Um, but we don't, it's, it's a much heavier commitment to bring on an employee than it is to hire a service, right? Um, so that's usually the first step. And there have been some clients that we've had where we've, we've, uh, we've gone our separate ways because we work them up to a point where they hire a person and the person is competent and the workload is fine for that person where they don't really need the agency support anymore. And then it goes that way. But with either case, you always need to go into the relationship with a, with a long-term view because 
we can work we can work with a brand for a month and probably not turn results honestly because there's so much research there's so much groundwork that needs to be laid where the investment really doesn't pay off for a little while and it's going to happen whether you hire a person or you hire an agency you always have to have that long-term view um <clears throat> we have, we have clients that have been with us for seven eight years um and the longer we work with them just like an employee the longer an employee works for you handling your marketing the more familiar they're going to be the more results they've seen the more they've they've uh, experimented the more trial and error the just the the more they understand you as people the more they own the brand so the longer term that you hold on to one the better your results are going to be mm. thank you and actually oh, oh. no go ahead colleen how do you recommend that people, um, if you're trying to reach multiple different types of audience, like you're trying to reach, say, um, businesses to participate in an event, but then you're trying to get customers to come into the event that are the general public, how do you think tailoring your uh, marketing and social media schedule to be a balance of family friendly and business works? That's, that's, a, that's a perfect, perfect question. Um, and it comes down to setting up those multiple personas. Now we cover just one. Most businesses have at least three or four and each persona has their own channels, their own content, their own metrics, and they need to have their own journey. So while you want to have, you want to get, say you're setting up an event, right? And you want to get, you need to get sponsors. You need to get attendees. You probably need to get speakers. You know, those are all different channels or different paths that you need to lead people on. And you need to make sure that you've laid the groundwork for them to follow those those funnels. So it's just multiple tracks, basically. Actually, I had a question more on the mechanics of certain aspects of social media. Um, like if you have a page with a lot of followers, um, for example, Facebook, um, sometimes I have a hard time getting all the information of our direct followers. Um, are there processes or things to be able to access those direct lists um, so that you're able to connect with them for, you know, sales and marketing purposes? You can, but it's going to be spotty because people have their own privacy settings. Um, and it's, it's also something that I find frustrating because uh, Facebook specifically likes to keep things close to the chest and even LinkedIn can be tough because LinkedIn's only going to give you so much information. You, you, you can request mm -hmm. an export of all their data um, and you could get like a thousand contacts with only two email addresses. So it's tough. It has a lot to do with privacy settings, has a lot to do with the way that the platforms try to keep that information sacred. Um, I will say uh, that did remind me of, uh, of an important um, note, and that is you can have thousands of followers and still not have a great social reputation. And the reason why is because it's not just the number of followers, it's the number of active followers. And this was put into place years ago to prevent, you know, you Sure, you can go on a Fiverr and you can get 5,000 Instagram followers, fine, but they're bots, they're not active followers. So pl platforms needed to combat that. And so it's now active followers, not just followers. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. I'm sure it's not the, the answer you wanted, but it's, it, 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 it's pretty tough is the answer. Yeah, and on the line. Okay, so it's, I'm glad to hear it's not just me. Um, but I did also want to ask, um, what have you found to be successful, um, say, from a sales capacity? I have heard, you know, a number of folks on the call today seem to be, you know, doing a little bit about sales and marketing. Um, so I'm just sort of thinking from a practical perspective, what are some good ways to uh, tap into the markets that you have, even if even when you don't have the visibility to be able to see um, about having some of those key conversations? Well, 
I think there, there are different ways to do it if you're a B2B versus B2C, and I can get, I could go into the weeds there, but I think ultimately the most important thing, regardless of whether you're B2B or B2C, is as, as, I, as I alluded to before, you use it as intended. Um, social media is, it's not a business directory. It's not classifieds. It's where people go on to be people. And the more people focused you are, show, showcasing your people, highlighting your, your, your philosophy, highlighting your culture, um, try, making, honestly, making your brand human is the most impactful way to start to build the reputation that you need in order to have a sales conversation. Because in order for somebody to be amenable to having a sales conversation, they have to like you. We do business with companies we like. So that's what you need to do first. Lay that groundwork, start to develop that reputation, and, and then have the tools in place that eliminate friction when it comes to when it comes to sales um a lot of a lot of companies have they'll have like online chat you can even integrate uh the messenger app into your website but do things that eliminate friction and work to build your work to build your online reputation because the more human you are the more approachable you are the more preferred you'll be and that works for b2b and b2c they're just different ways to go. Patrick, uh, I'd definitely like to get your information to have a probably a little more pointed conversation, um, you know, after this and, and, you know, get into details that may be, you know, my brand specific mm -hmm. um, and certain things being a franchise in an area that also has five other franchisees, um, you know, looking at a, a concerted plan there. But as a kind of a, a generic global um, thing, I know Instagram is working away from third party posting, I, I, you know, a lot of the, the newer businesses and that type of stuff, that is something that we recommend uh, for them to use or something like that. So they have consistent posts to their, um, to their location, but I know we're starting to get punished uh, for that now. Can you talk to, uh, is it just Instagram or is Facebook starting that, that stuff now? And, you know, I guess what would be a good balance on that? Um, there is a little part that you cut out there right after you said Instagram. So I, I know that it's essentially in a nutshell, I know that Instagram starting to, to punish people for third, having a third party system that, that post content to your own blog. Is it just Instagram? And, you know, it, I guess the devil's advocate, not doing it yourself versus using one of those things. What's uh, what's the way to go there? Well, you're right. And it's not just Instagram. Um, I know that Facebook and Twitter, and this, this has been an issue for years, even though it's become, um, it's become a little less of an issue, it's not as severe, like the, 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 the penalty, the drop in visibility um, isn't as severe as it used to be, but it's, it is still an issue and it's not just Instagram, it's, a, it's across the board. Um, there are also some other limitations to using, uh, using scheduling tools and those types of things like Hootsuite as well. Like um, it's hard to tag other companies. It's hard to tag people. Um, there are a lot of limitations. In a perfect world, I'd say, you know, you can, uh, you can use Facebook scheduling tools to schedule your posts. You'd have to do it on their platform. Yeah. Um, but as far as like to Instagram, which has always been difficult when it comes to scheduling, um, you kind of have to weigh your options. Uh, if you, if you do need to schedule, I say, do everything you can to boost the value of your posts. And then you have to go on daily to make sure that your tags are working. Yeah. Gotcha. But, but what we try to do here is we try to do as much manual posting as possible. Um, especially for things that we really want to get out there to people. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just go on and post it directly. All right. Um, second one, I'll just kind of run off shotgun here. Anybody else feel free to hop in and, and cut me off. So the, the Google reviews, as you're, you're looking to, to insert Google reviews and overall, you know, kind of as your, your strategy on, on diversifying, uh, that piece, we obviously have a kind of a third party net promoter score system that, you know, that pops the question, uh, it's been taken away that we're no longer allowed to 
have a direct link to post to Google. So you can have a link, but you can't direct post to, to the Google reviews. Um, you know, as far as me and, and online reputation, I think that's a, a, you know, a huge important thing. What are some ideas or tactics to help you talked about QR codes or something like that, you know, earlier um, with that already in place, what are some ideas and, and taxes to help boost your Google reviews um, or Yelp or any of those? Well, one thing that we, we get our clients to do and try to encourage other companies to do is set up a review program that hits them at at as many positive touch points as possible. Um, like whenever, when when clients get a uh, get an invoice from us, there's a request. And maybe some clients that have had us for years are like, all right, look, I've done it. Can you please stop? But, um, but that's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it, um, reaching out directly and a little, a little trick that we, we do here is, um, you know, periodic emails help, um, but it's just asking, never do a contest, never do go in for a drawing because that's just, that, that's against everyone's rules. But have a landing page on your website where you're, where you're directing people and go, great, do we, did we offer five-star service? Do we do, you know, an A-plus job? Do you want to share your experience? And then give two options, one for yes, one for no. Yes <clears throat> allows them to go to, you know, it could go to Google, go to Yelp, go wherever. It goes to no, it goes back to you. And then they can explain, you know, what the problem is, maybe give you a second chance at, you know, trying to get that, that five-star review. But it diverts those potentially harmful reviews coming over to you to try to remediate. Oh, totally. Uh, totally. Our, our own internal net promoter, <laughs> net promoter score system is certainly helped us to, uh, it gives them an outlet or, or some place to go flame, uh, flame out before they go public. Um, so that's been great. And then uh, Persona is obviously being part of a, a franchise. Uh, we get a lot of franchise or driven, or driven data. And so, you know, you being regional guy, is, do you notice a difference in Persona's uh, uh, on a more regional basis than what, what we, like uh, my, personas are going to be based on countrywide. So Texas and Florida and, you know, Vermont and all that type of stuff is all kind of crammed into to one. Is it worth it to go develop a, a personal persona for a, a Northern Virginia market, if you will, or, you know, is that going to get, get me close enough? No, I absolutely agree. It's not only is it going to actually reflect the, the community, it's going to do a number of different things by doing that research you're gonna be able to find out um, which, what type of, um, what type of interest they have, what type of, uh, there's, there's a, uh, a, a flooring contractor that we just did a percent of development for this week, I think. And what we learned is that by putting in our assumptions about the local area and focusing on a local audience, we found um, an overwhelming number of people that like a particular uh, news outlet, uh, that like a particular mom's website, um, that like very, very specific things that you can only get here. And now we know what we can align the brand with. We know what type of advertising channels we need to go after because we know where that audience is. That's not something you'll be able to get on a national scale unless you want national exposure. It's not going to be as exact as what it is in Northern Virginia. It's going to be the difference between doing Northern Virginia and Southeastern Virginia. Yeah. It's like two different worlds. So it is definitely worth it to focus on your service area and try to get as specific as possible. The one thing I did want to mention is make sure that you put your contact information in the chat, um, preferably your name, um, your phone number and email address um, so that Patrick's you know, able to connect with you. Um, often, you know, sometimes with people put emails and that sort of thing, and they'll be like, oh, wait, who is this? <laughs> so um, just make sure uh, to put the, the contact information in the chat so he's able to reach you. Also, um, if you like the presentation he gave today, 
Um, and, you know, certainly if you're a member of the chamber, I would definitely also um, uh, put on your calendar um, for um, December 11th, because we are going to have a, a social media and market research meeting. And uh, this is going to be really helpful in terms of just um, being able to uh, get some more insights. Um, you know, there's a lot more detail in terms of demographic data and uh, that sort of thing. We were very fortunate that uh, Patrick actually um, has uh, looked over our presentation and uh, has made a lot of good, a uh, lot of good edits and, and, and shared some more information. And he will be um, at the meeting on December 11th. So if you like what you heard today, we'd certainly love to, to see you back for that as well. Um, any more questions? I got a lot more questions, but I'll, I'll touch base with you. I'll, I'll <laughs> I don't want to drive everybody nuts. Okay, great. Excellent. And um, certainly if, um, and, and Patrick, let's connect offline because I definitely do want to talk with you about a couple of things really fast, okay? Okay, sure. Perfect. Thank you all for coming. And um, certainly, again, I um, hope to, uh, to see you guys in the, the very near future. Um, and uh, all right, let's see. Thank you, Heather and Patrick. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your information and feedback. Thank you. Thank you for that. Excellent. And um, I will definitely um, save this information so that you all can uh, connect with the, uh, I'll save this information and send it over to you, okay? Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you all for, uh, for coming and um, we look forward to seeing you again shortly. Thanks, have a great weekend, okay. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.